Hello and welcome. This is Alexa Linton with the Whole Horse Podcast. In this podcast, we explore all the ways that we as horse stewards can help with advocacy, well-being, and cutting-edge ways of working with horses. It's an exciting time, and I'm so glad you're here. Enjoy. All right. Hi, everybody. It's Alexa Linton here, and I'm here with uh, Laura Bird from One Spirit and a wonderful crew of uh, 23 other uh, animal lovers from around the world. And we're really excited today to be sharing with you a topic that's near and dear to both of our hearts. Um, it's it's an area where we've, we've um, I know I've been working in this area for a like, 12, 13 years, and Laura is, I think, quite similar, um, and it is the area, yeah, yeah, and so combined, we've got a, we've got a few years between us, um, we're, we're both, Laura and I are going to talk a little bit more about, you know, why we've come to this work and and why it's important to us but we're really excited that you're here to join us for this webinar we've we've called it um, the five things that animals want their humans to know about death and we really honor the fact that it wasn't easy to show up here um, we hope that you all have some tissues ready there you know there may be some some movement of emotion and energy um, tonight because this is a, a challenging topic and it's and it is emotionally charged and it is big for us but I think as animal lovers and what I call stewards it um, is something really really essential for us to to dive deeper into and to to sort of muster our courage and and find a way to explore more deeply so um so laura and i are here to to take you on that journey today and it, i really you know we're going to go through the points of, of what we're working with in a sort of an overview but for for right now i want to lay out like just a little bit around the itinerary today um we're, we're going to go through these these five things and just so you know, Laura and I, um, we call ourselves uh, twinsies. So we kind of have this, this thing going on. We, we, we have a, a plan, um, but uh, there's a possibility of tangents and things as we get into some cool territory. I also really want to encourage you to use the chat box if there is anything that comes up for you. And sharing amongst like-minded people and people that are going through similar experiences can be really, really powerful. So do use that during our call today I, I think that it may bring some some really great insight and also a sense of okay i'm not alone in this and how i've been feeling okay um also uh we as i said before we will have a chunk of time at the end that we leave probably about five to ten minutes depending on whether how many tangents we go on um where we will have a q and a as well um, at the end. Now, as I said before, if you have other questions that don't get answered, we'll be, we will be sending out an email asking for, for those questions as we are hoping to do another webinar within about two weeks. I think we have one scheduled for the 16th. Um, so uh, yeah, so there. Uh, that's sort of the, the way we're gonna move through today. Um, if there is any other questions, logistical questions throughout, please put them in the chat box and I'll do my best. Uh, we will do our best to check that out. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention before we begin is that um, this, of course, is a very emotional topic. You may very well have things that are wanting to rise up, um, emotions, you know, experiences during this session together. Um, you may have resistance even to things that we say. That is totally natural and normal. Um, just being aware of that for yourself, being, you know, being with it and being present to it is really, really important. And whatever you are feeling is valid and, and cool and all those things, all right? Um, so, you know, Really, we encourage here self-responsibility and self-care. Um, you know, this is obviously a little different than if Laura and I were working on a one with you on a one-on-one -on -one session. So we just really want to, you know, hold space for you to to do all the things you need to do for yourself and just really know, um, you know, know yourself within this and take take care. Um, and we are over just over the moon grateful that you decided to to join us for this little little journey tonight so yeah anything you want to add to that Laura 
Um, no, I think that's I think that's absolutely perfect, and I think maybe a great place to start um, is that I know that a lot of the people on the call are people I know here in Perth, or people that Jack and Janet from The Light Goes On and Happy House know in Singapore, and maybe they don't know you, Alexa. So would you love to would you like to share a little bit about um, about yourself, and, and especially about like I'm thinking it'd be great to find out a little bit about your book and, and the way that you've been um, looking at and working with death and animals. Because I'm sure people would love to know why, you know, why we came up with this topic. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I live on Vancouver Island in Canada. If you haven't been, you should come for a visit. It's awesome, except for right now, because it's rained for like the last two months every day. So not right now, but um, <laughs> at another time of the year. Um, <laughs> but it is very beautiful. Um, and I have been working with animals, doing uh, healing practice and teaching for the last 13 years. Um, and I found that this kind of this topic found me more than anything because when we work with animals, as Laura knows, um, they live shorter lives. Uh, death and dying is is much more of a um, an, a possibility for them. And so, and it's an ex extremely challenging time. Um, many of my clients, their animals are their children in a, in a way, uh, very very. Uh, essential, uh, important part of their families. And so um, this process of, of death and dying, I, I recognized over time how challenging it was, how hard it was for people to move through, how stuck they, they would sometimes get in that process and how much even a little bit of help in um, moving through it and integrating what was going on uh, was beneficial to them. And so I ended up writing a book um, called, I, I called it Death Sucks, A Straight Up Guide to Navigating Your Pet's Final Transition. And uh, I, it came out into the world, uh, I guess it was in March in Perth. Um, and I see some, some of the gals that were at my book launch are on here today, which is really exciting. And so I did that, and then I also, uh, me and Laura ended up teaching a workshop in, in Perth, which was very much an experiment, um, and Jack and Janet joined us for, for that, which was amazing. And it was, it was such an incredibly magical experience um, to sort of go into the dark and come out the other side. And I, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's really opened so much from, up for me. I'm an animal lover myself, and I've lost... Uh, many animals over my life and and um, I just you know want to be there for for the people that are that are going through that challenging time um, for for whatever reason we, we call ourselves transition transition stewards um, it's something that that I feel very called to supporting around so yeah thanks Laura no no problems at all and um for those of you that know me or, or those of you that don't know me, I also wanted to share a little bit about kind of how I feel I got called into doing this work and how Alexa and I kind of teamed up on it. And, and obviously Alexa had written the amazing book and um, we started, you know, sharing ideas. And essentially, you know, for me and, and the whole reason for this webinar, this whole idea that there are five things that animals want us to know about death is that over the 15 years that I've been doing healing work with animals. And sometimes that work has been hands-on therapeutic work. Sometimes it's been animal communication work. Sometimes it's taken me, and often it's taken me into doing like palliative care for older animals. And um, many of my clients, I met them and I began working with their animals when their animals were young and it was, you know, based around performance. And eventually with animals, it becomes palliative care and um, quality of life and eventually thereafter it becomes around communicating um, their animals wishes and then listening to their animals wishes and thoughts about death and the dying process and so yeah like I said after about 15 years of doing this I, I really started to notice that there were themes and that there were things that animals uh, commonly felt about death I guess because they don't have different cultural beliefs about death and they don't have um, different 
kind of environmental inputs. They don't have learned behaviour about what that stuff means. And, and it was really interesting and valuable. And in fact, almost, uh, and I, I could say maybe the most valuable thing that they teach us. So in the last few years, while I've been teaching animal communication, especially, I find that humans seem to have the most questions about death and the dying process. And different species, of course, think about that a little bit differently. A horse thinks about that a little differently to a cat because a cat regularly causes the death <laughs> of, of things. Um, but, you know, there were some common themes and I think um, it's really, yeah, I think it's great that we're going to discuss that today because not only is it one of the important things that animals inevitably bring into our universe as a theme or a topic, but it's also the one that we as humans, I think, struggle with the most because of all of our conditioning around that. Mm -hmm. and, and then that makes it really hard to reconcile sometimes and to, you know, we, we're seeing things from, from both perspectives. So essentially the, the five things that we, we're going to touch on today, um, if it's, I think it's probably time we, we sort of give you the, the little overview before we dive more deeply into each one, is, um, is that animals are, it's no coincidence that their life is shorter than ours. Either they are not meant to travel this whole journey with us in their physical form. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and about that and what that really is about and, and how that, um, how that is important and valid actually, like really is a key part of their role in our lives. We want to uh, talk a little bit about how, whatever health challenges and the death of um, your animal and whatever ends up being the thing that takes them, there's been huge amounts of guilt. Um, and um, especially when we understand mirroring and we understand how um, often our animals are showing us similar things to us in our health or in our life or in our emotional state and wellbeing. And there's this huge overwhelming common message from the animals that it is not your fault. It's not your fault. So we're going to dive a little deeper into that. Do you want to um, do you want to talk about some of the others, Alexa? Do you want to introduce some of the others? Yeah, I think um, the next is a really important one. We're going to talk uh, speak to grief um, and how important um, you know really allowing a, a full grieving process is and how our animals actually show us. Uh, the importance of that and it, you know this is often a missed place uh, not missed but misconstrued within you know sort of humanness so we want to speak a little bit more to that um, the next one is is around this idea of the circle of life you know um, this endings and beginnings and and you know how um, sort of yeah, for many animals, this is a, you know, these transitions are actually quite, um, they're just kind of built, built, built in a little differently. There's less resistance. Um, and we're going to speak to, to maybe a little bit around why that is and how we can share, share a little bit more in that. So it's an easier experience for all, all concerned. And then um, our fifth thing, we're actually going to go more deeply into some of the shared wisdom that both Laura and I have um, experienced over our many years working with with like thousands of animals probably be definitely between us um, during this time and what you know what are some of the core themes that come forward from those um, those animals through through our sessions with them and through our time with them um, yeah so this is what we're going to be going diving more deeply into today so mm -hmm. now if there is anything else that you 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 have a burning question about um please as i say write it in the chat i am thinking laura um what do you think about putting in the chat uh sort of the what brings you here question i'd love to hear a little bit more about 
Yeah, because I have a very, very strong suspicion that, you know, uh, especially with 2016 being the year that it has been uh, universally, it's been a universal number nine. It's been a year of closure and completion. Mm. It's been a year of uh, death, whether it's real death or symbolic death. Uh, I have a feeling that many people are probably here because of something that is happening with a really special animal and um, if you want to go ahead and, and type what has brought you here as like into the chat, um, I think it's a really nice way of kind of acknowledging that, you know, we're not here alone. We're here with many animals in spirit, or many animals that are our spiritual helpers that are still here, but they are asking us to really deeply look at these difficult topics. So if you want to, if you want to, you know, we've shared a little bit about what got us here and I, we don't have time to go around the whole circle, but yeah, it's a nice way of, um, you know, throwing all of our energy into this circle together. Absolutely. Be it a space one or not. Awesome. Cool. But some, somebody can break the ice. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe even while that's happening, you know, maybe even that while that's happening, we can already begin to talk about some of these topics. You know? um, great. Then we'll stay on time here. All yeah. right. Um, yeah. So let's, yeah, let's dive in here today. And, and so our first topic is around um, how our animals aren't meant to go all the way with us. And um, so, you know, there's a reason here why animals have a shorter lifespan than us, where, you know, as animal lovers, we may go, you know, through periods of our lives um, with various different beings by our side and even, you know, multiple, I mean, I know for myself and Laura, Laura, you've got five, how many horses now? Five, four? I've five. got five. Yeah. Five. yeah. And, you know, Ruby and, and Toby. Um, so many of us have, you know, more than one and, and, you know, even on, in Laura's case, there's, there's some that are more at the beginning of their you know, their time here, or we would assume so, and some that are reaching, you know, closer to, to their end time. You know, Ruby is 16 this year. Right? Yeah, she's going to be 16 this year. So, yeah, and Ruby actually, Ruby's my little Kelpie, for those of you that don't know her. She's a little, she's a sexy old nana now, and um, she did a little symbolic half-death at the, at the first uh, um, Death Sucks workshop. So she actually... She, she greeted everyone in the morning with, uh, with the fact that she'd nearly died just, just mere hours beforehand. So I didn't have a lot of sleep that night and I actually had to stare down the barrel of the gun that was teaching a three-day workshop about death with a dog that had just died. Thankfully, she decided to hang around. So, <laughs> so yeah, I did have a little, I had a little chat to her today about is, is the webinar safe? Can we do the webinar? Is that going to be all right? Like, yeah. Yeah, some absolutely beautiful uh, messages coming through. Certainly want to really acknowledge Jack and Janet and Hope, um, who has been just such a beacon of hope. Um, and I'm just watching so many. The, the, yeah, you, I don't know whether everybody can see the chat, but there are just absolutely beautiful messages coming through with people and their connection with their animals. Mm -hmm. So one of the um one of the really key areas i wanted to talk about in in relation to this idea that animals are not meant to go all the way with us is that i have a very strong sense from all of the work i've done that animals seem to fulfill a role that's a little bit like being our guide you know it's a little bit like having a spiritual teacher so if we look at the archetypal hero's journey, and if we are all the hero of our own story, our animals actually greet us at a moment when we uh, cross the threshold. So that's the moment when the hero really accepts the call. And when that happens, the mentor will come. And, you know, a, a lot of us think about our animals as our babies and our children. We think of them as, especially for those like myself, I don't have children, Alexa doesn't have children. And we also know that they're a lot more than that because sometimes we parent them and sometimes they parent us and sometimes we care for them and sometimes they care for us. 
And in the space of an animal's lifetime, they move through all the phases of their lifetime often, you know, from being a tiny little baby or a puppy or a foal or a kitten and going right the way through to being the crispy old sexy nana that my Ruby is these days. And, you know, so they bring all these different energies. And, and so really, unlike children that, you know, in a natural, in a full life would be there with us right until the end. An animal's role is to play a part in our hero's journey, to be responsible for being our teacher and our guide. And most of the time when you look at the hero's journey, the guide doesn't stay with the hero for the whole journey. There is a moment when the hero has to go on alone. I'm, gonna, I'm glad I've got my tissues here because I'm going to get a little emotional. But there is that moment where the, the guide, the wizard, the wise one, the teacher, the mentor says, I cannot go all the way with you. I was never meant to go all the way with you. And the hero says, no, I can't do it without you. I can't do it without you. And the mentor says, yes, you can. You have everything within you that you need to go on without me. And, and this is, I believe, one of the key reasons why these beings that are more than our children, that, we, that, that play a role in our lives that is not about them going all the way to the end, play such a powerful role. So, you know, it's... Yeah. it's like, like, <laughs> yeah. And they have no tissues. I know. <laughs> yeah. Have, have one. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and in a way it is the essence of, of their job with us, you know? So, um, as difficult as it is, you know, and, and what I've been thinking about it a lot today, just with the webinar coming up and, you know, I'm such a bleeding heart. I remember being a child and like watching, you know, I love my fantasy and I love my, you know, grew up. I think I hired the never ending story so much that nobody else, um, in Maddington ever got to watch it because I had the only copy of <laughs> how hired out from the video store. And I remember how hard I found it to watch the part where a tray's horse sinks into the quicksand. Whoa, everybody's and, <laughs> and yeah, and you know, and and these beings, um, these um, especially our horses that carry us further and faster than we can travel alone you know um they are they're our guides but they can't take us all the way and so knowing that about how magical they are and why it's actually not a coincidence that their lifespan does not exceed ours is actually it's it's built into our hero's journey is to learn from them is to um, embrace the lessons that they teach us and to be strong in that moment when they tell us that we have what we need to go on without them. Mm -hmm. mm. Ugh. Ugh. Not I know. to say it's easy. Oh, yeah. I know. And not to I say know. we won't miss them terribly. Um, yeah. I love that reframe, Laura. I think um, it's such a a beautiful way of, of looking at something that can be such a, such a challenging thing. Um, and I think, you know, both me and Laura really, um, you know, a huge part of our work, um, you know, I, both before and during and after this transition is, is really helping people to understand the, the roles that their animals did play and do play in their their lives and and you know why they were there in the first place and it's just absolutely extraordinary you know what comes up and and what you know and even at that time you know what what is shared you know even you know their animals are so incredibly uh, laura often calls it like others before self you know um we see that in our animals where they selfless and generous selfless and, 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 yeah. and oh so amazing and yeah. um you know this is just one piece is is there as much as we realize that our animals we saw that with hope right she wanted to be there until the end day if she could have been she would have just 
stuck around, um, but her body, you know, there it just was not possible for her. And, um, you know, and what a, what a beautiful way to see it. I mean, gosh, she's created a, a huge legacy, a huge legacy. Um, and, and that is a big part of it, Alexa, is the legacy that they create. If, um, you know, I uh, wish, uh, you know, wish we had time to get into it deeply, but essentially in the hero's journey, what happens is the hero leaves the ordinary world. You know, it's the world of before, um, before that animal. You know, we have our life before that animal. And then we, oh, and Michelle's got her little, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, and it, it's the world of who we were before we met that animal. And then we enter this magical, open-hearted space where our teacher, our guide, our mentor changes us and teaches us things. And we go on this journey. And, and at the end of the journey, it, the grieving process, the thing that's so hard is we return to an ordinary world. However, what we don't always realise initially because we have so much grief is that the ordinary world that we're in now is a new ordinary world, that we can never go back to the ordinary world that existed before that animal, that our ordinary world is now more magical. Mm -hmm. And the magical world that we were in with them has become the new ordinary world. So that's like a really basic overview of, of the hero's journey. And, and I guess sometimes when we are grieving so deeply, it's difficult to understand and have clarity on exactly what was the lesson, what was the gift, what had that particular animal come to teach us Hey, Parker. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, you know, some of the, some of the work that we do, um, some of the work that we're exploring in the, in the Death Sucks workshop gets into that. And, um, and there's a piece that I'm really super passionate about teaching, which looks at animal sacred contracts with us and ways of decoding those sacred contracts. So, um, you know, in a way, I think that might lead us a little bit into the next topic. Is there anything else you want to add about the, the shortened lifespan, Alexa? No, I think, I think we're good. Thank you for that. Yeah. My, oh, my pleasure. Um, because the next thing that we want to talk about is that it's not your fault. You know, um, lots of people on the call, I, I know many of you, I know that you are deeply in tune with the fact that animals are our mirror, that we're all connected I know that the synchronicities between the things that we're experiencing in our lives, whether it's health-wise, uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually, um, those challenges are often mirrored to us in our pets. And then that can make it especially difficult to deal with when things go wrong with them or when when their health starts to decline and we know and can see clearly that there is a pattern there that we um that we ourselves have and um and it's like it's one of the big things that actually is a gift from them to us in that sacred contract i i can't even tell you how many times i've i've had that conversation with owners at especially dogs, actually dogs, uh, because they're service animals, they seem to be um, even more fundamentally designed to um, mirror our energy back to us and experience and share symptoms with us. Yeah. And the, the question has come up so often, like, why are they taking this on for me? Can you tell them that they don't need to take this on for me? Please tell them they don't need to take this on for me. And the response from dogs <laughs> unanimously across the board is like, what? You don't want me to do my job? This is my job. I've, they have a shorter lifespan anyway. Yeah. And most of the time, the animals will, as they, as they transition, they will dissolve, transmute and transform the energy that is present that is can be of greatest service. So sometimes that is to highlight something, sometimes that is to literally dissolve it and take a pattern away. But they won't use their they won't let their death pass without 
using the like the transformative energy of it to be of service so you know really like it's not your fault and it's actually a lot more complex than being a straightforward mirror like if i have this thing then my dog has it therefore it's my fault that i haven't healed myself and my dog is now having to deal with the shitty experience of being my dog and they've got to deal with my symptoms because i can't deal with my it's like it's way way more complex than that and it's not it's not so straightforward we are all connected we do mirror each other but just because i have something does not mean that that is why my animal (laughs) a lot of the time it's in their contract as well and we have attracted each other to actually learn and transcend this like this pattern together and um and guilt and shame and uh, a sense of it being our fault actually doesn't serve the unfolding of the sacred contract around that. And usually when we unlock that little nugget, um, it becomes like a real aha moment of, oh yeah, of course, like, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love, I I just want to highlight, you know, a few pieces in there because, you know, Laura talked, talked there about the concept of resonance. And I think, you know, I I think it's, it's really worthwhile uh, having, having a, uh, just sitting into, I always ask this question, you know, of whether, whether we chose our animals or if they chose us. And most people sit there and go, I'm not really sure actually, like, you know, kind of, but then this happened and then that. Um, and what we start to realize is that it's very much, you know, it's both. It's absolutely both. And this is the resonance, right? There's a reason why out of a litter of 12 puppies, it had to be this one, right? There's a reason why when I walked in and you all met Parker here. Hey. Hey, Parker. <laughs> um, He's a wonderful little shit, um, and I adore him. <laughs> um, he, you know, there was a reason why he walked straight up to me as a tiny eight-week-old kitten going, hey, what took you so long, right? We've all had those experiences, especially if we've been, you know, animal stewards for a chunk of time. Um, I know myself and Laura as well have been chosen by many animals. <laughs> uh, my dog Kia, uh, my horse Diva. And so what we need to realize about this guilt piece is that they, you know, like Laura said, are running their particular soul contract beside us. You know, they're, they're walking the path that they were meant to walk as well. Um, as much as it may not make a smidgen of sense at this particular moment. Um, and, and we are going to talk about this idea of really unwrapping the gift. So all of our animals sort of leave us a gift. And I know Jack had a particularly profound experience with this in our Death Sucks workshop. Um, Is it okay to share a little bit about that, Jack? Yeah. She can hear you. No, she can hear you. I hope she can hear you. Otherwise, she can hear you. Yeah. 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 Um, Um, I actually would. Yeah. Uh, hi, I, I actually wrote the whole entire piece out, um, so so you can actually save some time and continue. But yeah, in absolutely. essence, um, um, well, hope brought me uh, to the workshop um, to heal some things that I felt that I was not um, heard, seen. Um, in essence, that uh, the, my very first dog cook um, witnessed some of the things that I went through that I found it very difficult to share with people because um, I was told not to share. And in the whole episode, I, I started to wonder whether the incident actually happened or not. So um, Hope brought Cook to remind me the gift that um, it was witnessed um, there was somebody who actually validated my experience and that was really, really big. Um, I shared that on the write-up. Um, if Later on, when they go to the Light Goes On website or at the Dev Sucks website, they will be able to read further on that. Yeah. And can, can you just share, Jack, how, how long after Coke passed did you open that gift? <laughs> uh, Coke passed on... Um, 14th of March, uh, 1998. Uh-huh. 
so almost 20 yeah, it is <laughs> yeah 18 years after nice. thank yeah. you thank you for sharing i appreciate that thank you okay thanks yeah it's it's never it's never too late to unwrap those gifts and um and especially at the time that we lose them, often we are grieving so much, it feels like there is no gift. But um, I, I invite you all to, um, to really think deeply about that because there, there really is always one. And it's, it tends to be um, more profound even than the love that we had while they were with us physically, there's something, there's a legacy that they leave us with. There's something, there's a realization and a, and a, um, a validation of something that we were always meant to be and grow into that, um, that their role as our teacher and our mentor gives us when they leave. So yeah, it's beautiful. Thanks, Jack. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and, I, you know, when we were doing the death sex workshop, this is just one of the pieces that we got a chance to unpack, which was, which is almost like, you know, we didn't realize we were going here, but it was, it was profoundly beautiful to, um, to open that up and sort of see, see clearly to the other side and what was really going on. I, I think, you know, both Laura and I and everybody that was there went, holy crap, <laughs> you know, this is, this is bigger than we even realized. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I wonder if, you know, this is a, um, it's kind of an area that is, you know, this, this whole idea of it not being our fault about this, you know, if I can just kind of like, like loop back and really close this, this circle around this idea of it not being our fault. Um, there, there really is genuinely a, a contract there around why things transpire the way that they do. So uh, if it's okay, I'd like to even share like quite a personal example um, that's really intricately linked to to even why I'm on this webinar because like I'm so not a I've this is like I said it's my second one. Alexa has dragged me kicking and screaming into the world of webinars and and speaking openly about like about all this crazy shit that we do. Um, and the other being that has been a massive part of me speaking about this crazy shit that we do was my, my beautiful dog, Grace. Some of you probably met her because she was a massive part of um, my teaching work. She was always there teaching with me up the front of the class. She was quite the stern teacher, um, but she was amazingly generous. And there were huge amounts of um, fear and worry that I had to battle through because she was a, a dog that was exceptionally gifted at teaching and um and had some behavioral issues that that made it also quite difficult to to teach with her in a class and i had to really like grow and expand my energy to work through that you know in some ways it would have been easier to just go i'm not gonna teach i, I just won't i won't teach these dog classes and she continually showed me this like real like opposing force of I'm the most amazing teacher in a dog situation and I am the worst teacher in a dog situation and I, and I persisted with it and um, I'm so glad I did and and at the time that she died she actually died of thyroid cancer which is the major uh, endocrine in the throat so in the throat chakra and she and I always, always had this joke that uh, she was going to evolve to speak the human language because she was incredibly smart, incredibly good communicator. Um, she was extremely good at teaching animal communication as well. She had these like wizard eyes that would just, you know, get the message across. And, um, and when she died, she died of, of throat cancer, essentially, which was exceptionally hard, exceptionally hard for me to deal with. And even now, the moment that the emotion comes up, there's that lump in my throat. And when she went, I felt, um, I felt in some way that it was my fault, that there was something I hadn't cleared in this area. Um, I'd been having a few endocrine problems of my own and, um, and my partner, Matt, was also having some endocrine problems. We thought he might have a thyroid problem. And the guilt about whether or not she had taken that on for us and the 
what really happened was that she shifted some energy to clear our throat chakras because that was part of her contract was to get us speaking about the stuff that we do, which is unusual stuff and not everybody's going to like it. It's a little controversial. You know, I, I talk to animals. It's, it's a, it's an interesting dinner party conversation. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, um, yeah. And so when I realized that she found a way to make not only her life meaningful, but her death meaningful, it blew me away. And, um, and actually I've just recently, um, seen if you guys knew Gypsy, my mayor Gypsy, um, who was the little photo that she was featured in the photo that she had, she actually also had a big goiter and, um, and my horse Buzz now is also holding a little bit of energy there. Mm -hmm. And um, ongoing process. Oh, it is a big process, you know, because sometimes it's not just one animal. Sometimes it's like a whole series of them, yeah. but they're all aligned with making it possible for me to speak through the deep emotion um, that is wrapped up in my love for animals and the difficult stuff and the fear of being controversial and the universal fear around animals about not being able to voice, not being able to have that voice and, and the pressure that I feel to be that voice. And, you know, I know that many of you guys out there are, are feel the same thing, feel that same emotion. So they are, they are not here as long as we are. They are here for a time and they will be of service in that no matter how they can be. And if their death can be of service too, if their death can be teaching, if their death can, mm -hmm. can transmute energy, if their body can take something away and recycle that, it's a beautiful thing. So, um, yeah, hopefully you guys really get it. It's, it's not your fault. It's not about how much work you do on yourself, how deeply you heal. Although do it, do the deep work, heal yourself, transition through it. But them doing what they do, they're doing it right. We have to trust them. Absolutely. I think that's huge, Laura, is the trust. And, and I, you know, thank you for that, for, for really bringing that all together. So beautiful. And thank you for sharing. You, I think sometimes an example helps because I know, wow. you know, it's like it's hard to see. You go, yeah, I can see that for someone else. But for me, I don't understand. I feel responsible and, and yeah. And we really free them. We really free them and we really see them when we get that this is, this is not our fault. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because what we can do is actually move beyond that place, right? And that's moving into our step three. We're totally yeah. going to go over time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, know. I, I knew it. Yeah. We were like, what are we going to talk about? Oh, gosh. Um, so this, this, this third thing is around grief. And um, oftentimes what happens with guilt is that we get stuck in that level of guilt and shame and we have a hard time dropping into grief and what we realize um, and both Laura and I have witnessed this is that animals are incredible teachers around grief and 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 what grief really is to me and what I've, I've written about in my book is that grief is a is a radical form of love it is a, um, a deeply honoring loving act to grieve and in our culture very often what happens is is people are like um well we've probably all had this experience of someone going well it's just a," and we want to strangle them after that um because it's like no it's not just a dog or a horse or a cat this was a incredibly important part of my family and my life and I really want to say right here now, be my witness, you are absolutely given permission to grieve as much as you need to um, these amazing beings that have graced our lives. And, um, and by allowing ourselves the spaciousness to go into that grief and to really um, understand it, it is, it is basically what allows us to 
um, transmute and let go and process and integrate all of these complex pieces that were, you know, what we shared with that animal in our lives. This is what allows us to actually come to a place of resolution and peace is going through that messy middle and, and you know, whatever that, that looks like for each and every one of us. It, it looks different for each animal. Um, sometimes we have what I call anticipatory grief. Um, with my dog B, I had a lot of anticipatory grief. She was, she was senile for, you know, or cognitive uh, dysfunction for the last two years of her life and went kind of in and out of, of lucidity. And so I had a lot of anticipatory grief. So when she finally passed, I thought, am I just being terrible and cold? You know, there was sort of an, an, a, a, just a release and a peacefulness that came to me. And yet when I was 10 and my hamster squeaky died, I cried for three full days. Um, and at the time I didn't have the tools to really move powerfully through um, that process. I ended up shutting myself down and shutting down my heart. At that time, I talked quite a bit about that in my book. And, um, and then to be able to open up and be present to the grief in the forms that it wants to take is so, so amazing. Um, me and Laura, can I, should, I just feel like I want to tell the story of Nancy and Fancy. Oh, yeah. So when Laura came out to Canada, because um, we now need to see each other at least twice a year because that because otherwise it's, it's just not okay. So Laura came to Canada last May and at the time the timing was amazing because a very dear client of mine her horse was dying and uh, fancy the horse and Nancy her person she was having an incredibly difficult time letting go and uh, so when I went out to see her the one time I started you know we, we went through a session and a process and I knew that Laura needed to, to be there. I knew that Fancy was going, but that she had a process that she needed to go through. And I can only tell you how incredibly beautiful this, this process was and how innately connected Fancy was to that process. We sat with her in her stall. She was lying down at the time she couldn't get up. And, um, and we all, cried in a circle around her grieving this beautiful life that she'd shared with Nancy and the people the other people in her life and we gave thanks and gratitude and prayed for her and her safe passage and I'd never experienced something quite so beautiful as that it was it was absolutely profound and um what I noticed in Nancy was by the time we were completing that process she was ready and she could let go and so and then she she grieved after but it was very different grief you know not it, it was this this beautiful grief full of gratitude and understanding and um and i i would it was it was amazing hey it was, beautiful. it was a beautiful moment it was a really beautiful moment and um you know and it's sort of not really something that we'd specifically um we're going to talk about uh, in this webinar, but you know, what I really remember about fancy as well is about the importance of trusting that you as a, as a guardian of that animal, as, as their steward, know the moment yeah. that nobody else can dictate that to you, that you are entrusted with that for them. And often we feel pressure to do things in the wrong timing and there is a really really deep part of your contract with that animal that they entrust you to make that decision they will give you the signs for that decision and I remember so clearly fancy in that conversation on that day as part of that ceremony she actually really surrendered she'd been lying down but sort of sitting up and um, and she was still really like eating a lot of food and, and I didn't realize that Nancy and, and Fancy had had this agreement that when she was ready that she would leave her food. And during that ceremony, she actually um, stopped eating her food and totally surrendered and laid down flat and we just all held her and it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. But that conversation and that, allowing ourselves to be ridiculous snotty teary messes 
in a stable um, sitting in the sawdust with this horse was such an important part of, of completion. Yeah. And, and even um, Nancy's big burly husband um, came and, came and was part of it. It was, it was really beautiful. It was, yeah. it, was, it was a beautiful moment. But, but you're right, Alexa, you know, this grief and this deep grief that animals feel, it's part of, it's part of our learning as well. We, as human beings, often we have it dictated to us in the same way that we often feel pressure around how this death should transpire. Yeah. Um, you know, it's different in different situations. It's, it's as unique as people's grief. And a big part of their purpose is to open our hearts. So we've got to uh, allow ourselves, we've got to not feel ashamed to go there and feel that deep grief. And, and what I've witnessed in animals, um, I've got a, a little story that I'll just share and I'll share it briefly because I know that we, we are on, on schedule here. But um, years ago when I, when I first started really putting out there that I, that I did the animal communication work that I did, I, I happened to turn up to treat a horse um, whose good friend, um, his, his friend's name was Cam, his name was Ricky. And Ricky was having a, a Bowen treatment. So he was having his body worked on. And on this day I rocked up, he was really unsettled. And so was the owner. And um, halfway through the treatment, she revealed to me, you know, it was like I couldn't, I couldn't feel or sense anything from either one of them. And halfway through the treatment, um, it all of a sudden just popped into my head. I said, where's Cam? And the lady looked at me and she said he was put to sleep this morning and we didn't want Ricky to see and he's in that, his body is still in that stable over there and we can't, and she was distraught and Ricky was distraught and all I, I just so badly wanted for Ricky to go and see him. And, um, but you know, the owner had taken so much time to shelter him from that, to protect him from that. So he didn't have to see the body, you know, he didn't have to look at, deal with any of the uncomfortable stuff around death. And uh, when I traveled back their way two months later, Ricky had not been himself. Yep. And I finally got up the courage to say, yeah, he wasn't allowed to grieve. And so we did a session around that and things shifted forward again. So Ricky, you know, and God love him. Ricky's got his, all his confidence back and is super happy and, and has remained so for, for all the years that I've known him now. But, you know, that was a big lesson for me from the animal kingdom about what happens when we deny ourselves the death. We try and protect ourselves from all this difficult stuff, yeah. but actually it's the, it's the difficult stuff and the tears and the snot and the emotion in all its ugly and beautiful wonderfulness that allows us to move forward into the next chapter. Absolutely. And this is something we talk a lot about in the death sex workshop, just because it is something that we stop up so much in ourselves and, and we feel so vulnerable around, we actually feel guilt and shame around feeling grief. And, um, and yet it is so naturally built into our system to actually create health and well being in us. It's, it's, it's absolutely natural. It's why when Laura and I go out and do a session and, and someone shares something um, that is, is heart wrenching or or you know sad like we cry because fuck we're human. <laughs> and I'm, an, and I'm a really ugly crier human. and I do it anyway. Totally, you know, and and recognizing that this is sorry, I totally just broke the seal on the swearing. I'm sorry. Oh no, I broke it a while ago. It's um, fine. Fuck okay, it. It's okay, fine. awesome. People All are right, drinking sorry. wine in Singapore Not and you feel guilt or shame. Um, yeah. and P.S. We're like we swear like sailors. Um, but I, you know, it's pretty funny. Um, yeah. So this is really, really critical is, is recognizing that it is a natural human emotion. It is so, so critical and important to allow it to come up and move and to, to feel, you know, find the ways to feel safe doing so. So yeah, it's, it's big. Um, and I, you know, I think Laura, like I know we were going to go into number four, but I think the timing piece is so like, I just really want to highlight that for everybody is this sense of being a steward for the timing. And this is an area where we get really sticky because we're like, 
when, when is the time? And I don't know. And they're hanging on. And it's just, why do I have to make this call? You know, this is, this is something um, I think that's really, really foundation for us with our animals because we have um, the gift of mercy kind of that, that we can share with them. This is really big. You know, our animals are insanely grateful that this is something that we can give to them. Yeah. And, and I, 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 I see that over and over and over again in sessions is they're like, I'm ready. Um, and then, you know, they share with us, like, like Fancy did, putting her head down. It was so obvious at that moment. I remember that moment specifically where she was like, okay, I'm good. And Fancy and Nancy were both fighters, right? Nancy had a really hard time going into her grief and into her feelings. She was tough, I'm tough. I'm not gonna. And for, for Fancy, the moment came when Nancy finally let her guard down and broke down with her, right? Yeah. And Fancy was, my work here is done. <laughs> it was really, really amazing. So I, I just want to share that here. And we, I know we're getting kind of close on time. So I'd love to, Laura, skip to, we were going to, number four is the circle of life. And I know there's lots more that we can kind of delve up in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. People can watch The Lion King. And that'll <laughs> be yeah. I know, I don't, because it's a quick take. It's a cliche, right? But without getting too deep, deeply into it, it's you know that that whole circle of death and rebirth. Animals understand very, very intimately that we all are part of a circle of life. That life force is generated by death. That carbon is recycled. Um, I'm hoping to. In fact, I might even get off my butt and write that blog. I've got a really um, interesting thing that that came up I was chatting to the animals about to do with this circle of life and also therefore what they want done with their bodies but it's oh, yeah so maybe we can come back to that or maybe we can talk more deeply about that even in the next webinar I'd because love that yeah yeah because we just talk too much we, talk we just too talk, much. Much. We talk too we really much do. um I also so so number five here um, and, and cool thing about, about the circle of life is we've, we've actually, when I look through this, we've actually touched on a lot of these pieces around the legacy. And, um, you know, in the Death Sucks workshop, we do a lot of work around honoring legacy. You know, how do we honor, um, you know, what does our animal want to be honored through? Um, for example, the cover of my Death Sucks book, which I should have with me and I don't, um, is actually a, a beautiful dog named Truffles who wanted to be honored by being on the front of my book, um, which is amazing. So I, uh, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And they, they're very different about endings and beginnings. We actually have a reading, which maybe we can do next time from B um, about uh, what death, mean we actually had a, a conversation in the class in Perth and Jack and Janet will remember this fondly I'm sure where we asked the animals four questions and we asked them um, and these are animals that have passed over we asked them what do you want to know about or what would you like us to know about life about death about connection and about gratitude and I can only tell you that the answers that came up we were all bawling our faces off at that point it was so beautiful um, and profound and we were you know our last number five here just transitioning right in is shared wisdom in some of those pieces that were channeled so laura is there i, I love that piece around gratitude that you shared yesterday would that be yes um, this is actually i want to read this this is actually when we did this um channeled um question i asked b i asked alexa's dog b who um, is deceased and was deceased at the time that I asked her this, um, you know, what she had to share with us about gratitude. And I, and I love this reading that, you know, and just before I read it, I just want to say there is no time limit on us connecting with, communicating with, um, understanding the nature of the gift, unpacking the gift that our animals have given us. And actually in a lot of ways, gratitude and what B has to share with us about gratitude, it makes sense that that is one of the key pieces to understanding that. And I think it's especially difficult sometimes to have gratitude for their death. We often feel gratitude for their life. 
um, but what they give us in their death, what they give us when they leave us and we realise that we are strong enough to go on without them uh, is massive. You know, this question of what will their legacy in our lives be? You know, what would they want it to be? And, and I think about that every day, to, you know, in being brave enough to do what I do. I thank the animals that have taught me this. You know, these lessons were hard, hard learned. And, and I don't think I could really appreciate what they've given me without also gratitude for the way that they left me and when they left me and how they choose to leave and, the, and their wisdom in that. And sometimes that's hard to see. So, you know, this is some shared wisdom. This is, you know, these are sometimes common themes that come up yep. from our animals. And they, like us, seem to connect even more deeply and profoundly with the universal truths when they no longer hold their physical bodies. So, B, the, the, little, the little old Nana yep. Whippet, when we asked her, what does she have to share with us about gratitude? She says, gratitude is the master frequency of the universe. It allows us to transform what is into its ultimate state of potential. It creates worlds and expands all existence. It is essential. It is as essential to the spirit as water is to the body. It is the highest and purest form of love, embodying healthy love, acceptance and wisdom. It is the perspective of transformation, growth, healing and regeneration it heals the earth it heals the earth so thank you b mm. she was a fabulous little creature she's a fabulous little sprite wasn't she <laughs> very much so yeah. your animals are still with you all the time um you know the last thing that i want to say without taking up too much time is they really are with you all the time matt and i both awoke um probably about a year ago um and i was crying and matt said oh my god what's wrong and i said i just dreamt it was so real that grace was in the bed with us giving me a cuddle and his face just changed and he said i just had the exact same dream yeah so they are they are with us yeah, well, I've had the similar things where I have clients, intuitive clients that come to my space and say, it's very funny, I keep seeing this little sight hound around. Yeah, yeah. they're always yeah. there. And yeah. it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And sometimes all we need is a little help opening our eyes to um, and senses to experiencing them in this new form. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, both Laura and I know this to be true as we spend our lives talking to animals um, and connecting with them both here in present form um, and also beyond beyond their physical form. And uh, we both know that, that, that their consciousness is very much present in, in both those spaces. And yeah, it's really amazing. Thank you for tuning in today to the Whole Horse Podcast. Laura and I are so grateful that you're here. For more information on Laura's work, you can head to www.onespirit.com.au or to my website, www.alexalinton.com. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next time.